uh, recruitment maneuvers, comparison of techniques for benefit and harm. Thanks for your patience. I'm going to uh, return to a theme that we had yesterday and talk in practical terms about uh, how to recruit the injured lung. And I think we set the rationale for this yesterday quite well. And hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll understand how I think it should be done uh, at the bedside. I'm going to uh, outline some key principles and then talk about methods and then some experimental studies and clinical trials, both in terms of efficacy and uh, hazards. Now we talked yesterday about why it is necessary to recruit the injured lung. When the plateau pressure is increased, we move from a tolerable level of tissue strain to an intolerable level of tissue strain. And what we need to do is to reduce the lever arm, which is causing the shear stresses. The easiest way to do that at a fixed plateau pressure would be to increase PEEP and to therefore keep the, 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 the lung recruited. This is, a, I know, a very simplistic model of what's going on here, but I find it surprising uh, how people get confused between what's important in terms of plateau pressure and PEEP. When we use PEEP to drive up plateau pressure, the same plateau pressure value becomes much less injurious at least in the, in the experimental laboratories. So recruitment is to minimize those interfaces that we talked about yesterday. So here's a bottom line slide if you want to go out and get coffee after this. Uh, I, think, I think the prone position is a quintessential recruitment maneuver for reasons I'll, I'll cover in a moment. We need adequate PEEP, that's clear, and adequate tidal volume. And there's a possibility that if we use inadequate tidal volume, we might be able to replenish the recruiting effect with size, with, with uh, tidal volumes that are, are bigger periodically. Recruiting maneuvers, I'll be speaking a lot about that. Minimizing lung edema is not a small item because the weight, the compressive weight of the lung is in part dependent on how much edema there is. I don't know whether that helps. I don't know whether using the lowest acceptable FiO2 helps either, but it makes sense to me because absorption collapse is more likely at high FiO2s in those lung units that have poor ventilation. And some people would say, and I think I, I uh, have some reservations, that gentle, spontaneous breathing may be a way to recruit the lung, and perhaps the variation in tidal volumes that you and I are going through right now are essential to uh, maximize our, our recruitment and keep the lung fully open. The question, of course, is should the lung always be opened? Primary ARDS that is, inhalational type of ARDS, is less recruitable than secondary ARDS. Oleic acid injury is a good example of uh, secondary ARDS, as is sepsis. As Luciano showed you yesterday, recruitable lung units may comprise less than 10% of all the CT density that we see. Now, I happen to think that's an important 10%. Because, as I said yesterday, I think a small number of lung units can really um, uh, be important in terms of progressive lung injury. Must all atelectasis be reversed? Even if you can open the lung, must it be? Or can you leave a section of it quiet? And, uh, and if that's the case, can it be kept open? Is prevention of closure essential to preventing VILI? And that may depend on the plateau pressure. Again, as we said yesterday, no injury occurs in obesity or congestive heart failure despite basilar collapse that you can hear by Rawls and Ronkai. <laughs> 
Now, I, I, Art gave a beautiful presentation this morning. One thing he didn't get a chance to, to talk about was acoustic monitoring. But this is getting a lot of attention around our place right now, a multiple map of, of stethoscopic microphones that listen for crackles. If you hear crackles in a patient with ARDS, you know that some lung units are opening and closing with every tidal breath, and you should try to minimize that. That's why a good clinician will listen behind the patient, not just in the front. Okay, now you've seen this many times. Uh, this is a paper that actually uh, Luciano's group put together. I was an author on it. Uh, and he showed you the opening and closing curves. And I just point out here that encircled there on the, on the right-hand part are lung units that begin to close at pressures as high as 45 centimeters of water. So at no peep that I feel comfortable with can we keep those lung units open even though they were opened by these high, high inflation pressures. So some lung units can't be kept open by any reasonable PEEP level. And we know that full recruitment, even in a very recruitable lung injury model, uh, requires high pressure. These, these terminal lung units, 93% of them are open at a pressure of 45 in this highly recruitable model, but here at 35, we still have 20% of all recruitable units in this model unopened. So if, if I take that as a starting point and I say, well, I feel comfortable with a plateau pressure, uh, and this is beginning, you know, it's an, it's an acute lung injury model, in the 20 to 30 range, let's say 28 centimeters of water, you see all of this uh, unopened tissue. And is that dangerous? Well, if I, if I use a pressure that high, I have recruited more lung units. But I've also increased the lever arm because I've gone to a higher plateau pressure. If I let the lung come down again, I have more collapse but I have a shorter lever arm, a smaller plateau pressure. And I don't know which one of these two strategies, if either, is preferable because they're altering the key variables that determine ventilator-induced lung injury. How much collapse and how high is the plateau pressure? Now, some of you know the 40-40 rule, okay? The 40-40 rule, I think the therapists in the audience might Remember, that's applying 40 centimeters of water for 40 seconds because you need both time and pressure to open the lung. Where did that come from? Okay. Art showed you how on sequential inflations, the lung pops open. Those of you who have been in the, uh, in the OR and see an open lung know that if you put a, a, a high pressure on, it takes a while for the lung to fully open. And here... This is from uh, Katz and Fairley back in, uh, in, the, in the 80s, when, uh, just after my training. Here's a 10 centimeter of water incremented peep. And he's looking at the breath number until you get to 100% of the FRC associated with that step change. And what you see is that it takes multiple breaths, multiple breaths, and in fact, about 10 breaths. And that's about 40 seconds. So it's not unreasonable, these, were, these are post-operative patients, it's not unreasonable to, to apply the 40-40 rule. The prone position, we've talked a little bit about this yesterday, uh, the prone position is, uh, is used by almost all the, all the academic centers now, but, but actually probably fewer than 50% of the community hospitals are using it uh, in, in severely ill patients, and I think they should. In the prone position, the, uh, there's a dramatic change in conformation. And Luciano's talk segues very nicely into this picture. This is a dog, anesthetized. And you, what you see is an external plumb bob here, and you see the, the heart, and there's some catheters inside the heart, the spine, the ribs. This is the area most at risk for damage. I showed you that yesterday. 
When we take that animal with the same airway pressures, turn them over, prone, take a look at that area, that's what happens. The transalveolar pressures have dramatically improved or increased the static transalveolar pressures. Also, the, air, the airway drains better. Therapists know that too. If you want to get the secretions out of the lung, best thing to do is to put the patient's head down. Second best is to put them on their back and clap them. So the secretions, the fluids that are inside the lung, uh, also have protein in them and may inhibit surfactant. So perhaps the drainage is better. I don't know that. Also, the heart sinks in the chest, and that allows the lungs to expand. Okay? So the heart gets out of the way. And this is one untested hypothesis we've had for a long time, not just us, that the lymphatic drainage, when you get edema inside the, uh, the lung, the lymphatics need to clear it out of there. And it is possible that there is a, a better gradient for lymphatic drainage, with most of the lung being high and the heart being low, to try to clear things up. And I think we've seen that over a course of days. But of course, there are many forces at work there. Proning achieves and stabilizes recruitment. Not only do you achieve recruitment, but once you're in the prone position, you have that regional peep continuously. So here's a, here's a study from our lab a few years ago. Um, I, I, the, the details are not particularly important. This is supine. This is prone at two levels of PEEP. Notice that in this injury model, we did a recruitment maneuver, and we rapidly lost its effect in the supine position. At the higher level of PEEP, we were more successful with the recruitment maneuver, and I'll come back to that theme a little bit later. In the prone position, it doesn't matter really what, prone, what, what level of PEEP we used. We basically got most of the benefit from the recruitment maneuver accomplished, even at the lower level of PEEP. What's happening here? This is the recruitment maneuver, and the position change actually puts on a more effective level of end-expiratory pressure. Okay. Now... The common effects of proning in early ARDS, more homogeneous transpulmonary pressure. So what? What does that mean? It means that I can use one airway pressure profile at the airway opening and influence most alveoli pretty much the same. It's unlike in the supine position where there's a huge gradient of transalveolar pressure with dependent lung units being more collapsible. In the prone position, at least the studies that have been done in the lab, indicate that the distribution is more uniform, so that one PEEP and one tidal volume combination, one plateau pressure, have pretty much the same effect whatever alveoli you're looking at. And that gives us a little more control. It increases and sustains the traction on dorsal lung units, and that, le that leads to better ventilation perfusion matching, and you see that with... Uh, the changes in CO2 and oxygenation we were talking about yesterday, and a tendency, but not in all cases, for recruitment, depending on many factors, which I'll get into in a moment. Improved airway drainage, modestly increased FRC. I think this has been nicely shown by, by Harris Russos and his group uh, from Greece in a recent paper, uh, and reduced tidal tissue strain. We talked a lot about that yesterday. What is this tidal strain business? It's causing ventilator-induced lung injury. How was that indexed? In a simple way, tidal volume divided by aerated FRC. So if we can reduce this t tissue strain, again, this has been shown, uh, we may be able to reduce ventilator-induced lung injury. One thing that was said uh, yesterday, and I agree with it em emphatically, is that there are differences between using oxygen as an indicator of recruitment and using mechanics as an indicator of recruitment. Neither one is optimal. This is the same animal, same points in time, continuous intraarterial blood gases. So in green, 
you see the oxygenation curve. Lots of shaping information here. Beautiful pressure, not, uh, pressure oxygen relationship. But this is what the mechanical properties looked like. And in fact, if you were to choose a lower inflection point there, it would be less than 10 centimeters of water peep mechanically. If you were to choose it on the basis of oxygenation, the, the, the appropriate peep, and we know we're not supposed to use inflation curves, but since it's tradition, you would put it in, in the range of 20. And the same thing is true on the deflation part of both curves. What's the point? The point is that oxygenation may be as good as we can do because of convenience, but it doesn't give us all the information in, uh, even in an experimental model. Returning to this, uh, this particular example, uh, we're looking at those oleic acid animals that Luciano showed you earlier. Here's PEEP of 5, PEEP of 15 on this lower panel, and low, medium, and high tidal volumes. And I think what you can see is that there is marked difference. Even at the same level of end expiratory pressure, imaged at the end of exhalation between the high tidal volume and the low tidal volume, with a high tidal volume recruiting more tissue. Even at 15 centimeters of water peep, there is a difference. Now that's occurring because the opening pressures have this histogram. You will not open all lung units in the convenient range in which to work. You have to go to higher lung volumes to open them up. And you can see that as we trace again the, uh, the, the closing profile, that uh, a larger tidal volume would be associated with the recruitment of some additional lung units. Now I've stopped this image here at 30 centimeters of water, which is what I think many people consider the upper limit of acceptable these days, and for somebody with a normal chest wall anyway. And you notice that there's a lot more recruitment going on. Whether, whether it stays open or not depends on the level of PEEP, but clearly there's that potential. Uh, this is a typical range of pressure to work in, 10 centimeters of water PEEP and 30 centimeters of water plateau, and we get most of the lung units open when we work in that range. Unfortunately, we also have the potential when we're using 10 centimeters of water PEEP to undergo cyclic collapse of this population of alveoli. Those are the lung units, at least in these people with primary ARDS that we studied, that uh, are at most risk for tidal opening and closure. So we've got to do something else. We've got to raise PEEP and we've got to get the lung open. Richard Brochard and colleagues uh, had this study which was mentioned yesterday uh, basically saying, look, if we cap the plateau pressure at a certain level, that, that yellow bar is the, the plateau pressure um, that was being used here, uh, and we get there with a larger tidal volume versus higher PEEP. This is, uh, a, a larger uh, this is a larger tidal volume, this is the, the larger, larger PEEP, and this is recruitment. And you notice that for the same plateau pressure, you opened up a lot of lung units, but you let some close if you don't use a high enough level of PEEP. And so the lament at the bedside is, well, the recruitment maneuver was nifty, but it only lasted a few minutes. Well, you've got to let it, you've got to adjust your PEEP level. If you get a recruitment response, as opposed to the surfactant depletion models that you'll find all over the literature, you will lose your recruitment effect at the same level of PEEP in most instances. So here is, here's what we do with a recruitment maneuver. This is 40 centimeters of water, 40 of PEEP, and then we march down to lower values of PEEP and tidal volume until we begin to see a compliance change or an oxygenation change. So we, 
we open it up and then we don't allow the lung to close until we get to the point where we've gotten the signal that the lung is closing more lung, lung units uh, than uh, is comfortable for us. And this is the way we, we used to do this. Now, I was talking to Len Hudson earlier, and Len was my role model when I was going through uh, uh, my training in Seattle. And I remembered, and Jeff Carey probably remembers, using 50 centimeters of water, 60 centimeters of water, uh, airway pressure, plateau pressure is not much different than that, for days on end. So I don't worry about a minute or two of high pressure. Some people ask that question. A minute or, t or two of high pressure for recruitment, I think, is an, an acceptable compromise. Um, when you look at what is drawn for a recruitment maneuver, you go to total lung capacity, and then you come down into the uh, expiratory limb of the pressure volume relationship, this is what we'd like to see, but what we usually see is that the benefit is very transient if PEEP is left unchanged. This is a study from uh, Kai Mei Lim and his Korean colleagues, uh, basically using s uh, several forms of recruitment maneuvers. The, the one that um, left PEEP at a higher level than it was pre-procedure did considerably better, the recruitment maneuver plus PEEP versus the recruitment maneuver uh, only. The times here, pre, post, 15 minutes, 30, 45, and 60 minutes. Notice that with the recruitment maneuver only, you might get a transient blip, but it's gone. The lung collapses again, unless you use a, uh, a PEEP level that's increased. Another important observation was made by Steve Lipinski and some others and Bob uh, Kaczmarek in this, in this particular example. Multiple maneuvers may be necessary for optimum recruiting effect for the same pressure. I'll come back to that in a moment. But you saw the, the, the nice uh, movie that, that Art had where the, the lung was in, being inflated basically by the same pressure time and again, but it was popping open over a period of time. And this is, a, this is also true for recruitment maneuvers in the studies that have been done by Fugino and, and Lipinski as well. Multiple recruitment maneuvers may be necessary. And that'll come back to haunt us when we talk about what I think should be the ideal uh, maneuvers. Uh, I, I just like to point out that the rec recruitment maneuver effectiveness and durability vary with the type of lung injury. In a lot of the experimental literature, it's lung lavage, surfactant depletion, recruitment maneuvers are done, and the effect is more or less sustained. But that's not true for oleic acid injury, and it's not true for uh, pneumonia, as we showed in large animals a few years ago. The determinants of recruitment effectiveness depend on the ARDS category, we, told, we talked about that, the inherent potential for response, primary versus secondary, for example, the ARDS stage, and it turns out that responsiveness does diminish over time, as you might expect, as the lung begins to remodel. Starting PEEP and tidal volume. This is the most important thing you can look at when trying to interpret the literature. Were you well recruited to start with, in which case a recruitment maneuver is not going to do you any good? How much higher than the plateau pressure you're using is the recruiting pressure? Okay? How many more units can be opened? The duration of response is a function of post RM PEEP, and the aggressiveness and type of recruiting uh, method uh, is important. It's often limited by tolerance. In uh, critical care medicine, within the last three or four months, uh, there was a set of uh, investigators from Israel who wrote a comment about an editorial that I wrote called, you know, it's all relative, the, the recruitment maneuvers. And I had advocated recruitment maneuvers as an intrinsic part of my practice to set peep and tidal volume. And the study that, was, that came from the ARDSnet said, basically, they don't work very well. And so he said, I'd like to, tell, like to share with you our experience. They had a dying patient, hypotensive, 100% oxygen, 20 of PEEP, and going to die. So what did they do? 
They just kept pumping up the recruiting pressure. I'm not advocating this in every patient now. To, uh, I think it was 85 centimeters of water. 85 centimeters of water. What happened? The lung opened at 85. The hemodynamics improved dramatically. And in fact, that's really what does happen when you open the lung. And you can guess why. You open the lung, not only do you better oxygenate, but you also diminish pulmonary vascular resistance. You let the right heart recover a little bit, and you can spin people out of a disaster quickly. Doesn't happen often, happened in their case, and it, it shouldn't be abandoned uh, uh, just because you haven't had um, a positive experience. Now, in the ARDSNET uh, recruiting maneuvers trial, everyone who I've talked to, including the investigators, say, you know, we probably didn't do that just right. Uh, if you look at the recruitment maneuver group and the, sh and the sham RM group and the greatest increase in oxygen saturation, this is the spectrum that they saw, and then they said, you know, recruiting maneuvers really didn't help a whole heck of a lot. And I agree with them. But if you look at what the starting peep was, it was 13.8 centimeters of water. It was high. And the plateau pressure was 26.4. Okay, that's not low. It's not terribly high. But as we look at this diagram, we look at that plateau pressure, and we look at the recruiting pressure, which they limited to 35 centimeters of water, because that's what was agreed upon as being safe. Look at the number of lung units you can recruit. It's very small. And did they increase PEEP at the end of the trial? No. The maneuver. So it's not surprising that it, that it didn't work. Um, this is from Marco's group, uh, Grasso and colleagues. He thought that they, they think, and, and they're probably right, that non-responders and responders to recruitment maneuvers, and again, they didn't change PEEP post-recruitment maneuver, uh, behave differently hemodynamically. During the recruitment maneuver, and this is a sort of a 40-40 maneuver that they did, what happens? During this period of time, you have mean airway pressure up at that level of 40 centimeters of water. Not surprisingly, you, uh, you, oh, and you're overdistending the lung, the blood pressure falls. And with responders to the recruiting maneuver, you, you get a, a nice bump in your FRC, but you don't really change the blood pressure very much. And you don't change the cardiac output very much. But in Marco's experience, you, you had a 60% of your cardiac output was lost during this interval of trying the recruitment maneuver. Now, I'm going to tell you that I think this is a very important observation and one of the limitations of the 40-40 maneuver. We did a recruitment study, and I'm going to end up uh, talking about this, trying to look at all the factors that influence recruitment, looking at three pig models of acute lung injury with three methods of recruitment at three levels of post-RM PEEP. Okay? So we looked at oleic acid, you can think of this as an endothelial or secondary form of ARDS. We injured the lung with a ventilator strategy and then used those injured lungs and tried to recruit them. That was our ventilator-induced lung injury uh, model. And we had pneumonia, which was uh, instilled bacteria, creation of pneumonia, fever, the whole business, and then uh, trying to recruit that. We use three methods, the sustained inflation, the 40-40 business, incremental PEEP, which the Koreans had suggested you just march up on the PEEP level, and you cap your plateau pressure. You keep that within bounds. Okay? And then we did high-level pressure control ventilation, where you simply increase the PEEP and preserve the driving pressure or the tidal volume. You could do it with volume control, but that's the way we did it. And the three levels were the starting value of PEEP, which was 8, returning to 8, or going up to 12, or going up to 16. And I'm going to go very rapidly through the data. Why did we compare this one 
in, 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 uh, to this one. Well, I, as I told you, pressure is important and time is important in recruitment. So we wanted the total time and pressure product of the recruiting, uh, recruiting maneuvers to be identical. Okay? So we used 45 centimeters of water, 16 of PEEP uh, for our PCV uh, maneuver. We kept it going for two minutes, and our ID ratio was one to two. That gave us a time duration exactly the same as the same plateau pressure, or 45 centimeters of water, for 40 seconds. Okay, just so that you understand that. And here's what we found. First of all, averaging all the models, recruiting maneuvers done at this point, it's the post RM peep that determined the PAO2. And that shouldn't, that shouldn't surprise anyone. We found that the recruitment maneuver benefit is transitory in oleic acid injury. Here you have um, control value and you have the uh, incremental peep, the lower one. You have the uh, sustained inflation and you have the pressure control ventilation. Now notice something here right away. The PCV maneuver looked a little more effective at that, that level of, uh, uh, of post-RM peep. And a similar pattern for 12 and 16. We found that PCV was the best recruitment uh, maneuver uh, method in, in the ventilator-induced lung injury model. Um, and we asked ourselves, does the recruitment maneuver add anything to simply increasing the PEEP? And we found that for ventilator-induced lung injury, it clearly did. But for the other models, it didn't. Now, the pneumonia turned out to be really, we also measured volumes, by the way, and these two papers, they're back-to-back -back papers, are going to appear in critical care medicine, one looking at efficacy, one looking at hemodynamics. And we looked at vol volume as well as oxygenation. Uh, the PCV model was slightly better than the others in terms of uh, the volume increments 15 minutes after the recruitment maneuver at, uh, at 12 and 16 centimeters of water peep. Okay, now here, this is an important message. At least in this anesthetized pig, a recruitment maneuver can profoundly depress cardiac output. Da averaging all the data from the three models, this is the baseline percentage, 100% up here, down to about 60%, very similar to what Grasso and, and Ranieri uh, showed, with recovery as, uh, as you go to the, the various PEEP levels. The RM effect on cardiac output varied among the injury models, however, with ventilator-induced lung injury having a lot less effect than the pneumonia. And there, there are echoes of this throughout the literature. In pneumonia, it may be a little more dangerous to, to, uh, to escalate the pressure. So the models vary in terms of tolerance. If you have a pneumonia model, look at the difference between sustained inflation coming down to about 35% of your original cardiac output and PCV, where you're still back up at 70%. And you guys know why. Why is it? Because in the sustained inflation model, you've got a very high mean airway pressure and lung volume sustained over time. PCV model, you have the relief of the high pressure periodically. Uh, and in fact, no recruitment maneuver performed well in the pneumonia model. So the implications here are that RM effectiveness depends on injury type, the post-RM PEEP value, and the method of performing the recruitment maneuver in certain settings. In the ventilator-induced lung injury setting, the PCV was clearly more efficacious as well as safer. The RM hazards are greatest in effectiveness least in pneumonia, and PCV may be better tolerated than sustained inflation for an equivalent effect. Our use of PCV in preference to sustained inflation be is because it is safer. You are actually doing multiple recruitment maneuvers with each breath. Art showed you that in his, uh, his movie. It's effective 
It maintains ventilation during the recruitment process. And it's actually very simple to implement. You just change your alarm setting on your, on your ventilator and bump up the PEEP, keeping the driving pressure the same or the tidal volume the same. Monitor hemodynamics during the recruiting interval. If, blood pressure, heart rate, those things that you can easily, easily track. Repeat recruiting maneuvers after a position change, circuit break, or deterioration of mechanics or oxygenation. Do we do recruitment maneuvers all day long? Absolutely not. If there's not been a change in oxygenation or mechanics, we don't, we don't do it. If we're going to change PEEP level, then we do. If we feel like we need to respond. If we break the circuit for, for some reason, or uh, if, if we've had a position change, we will, re we will do it. Consider multiple recruitment maneuvers uh, and high pressures in refractory cases. And I told you about one of those from Israel and employ the prone position and or PEEP to consolidate the RM benefit. The, R the recruitment maneuvers, however, are of unproven safety. They don't always work. The best technique is unknown and may vary between patients. If the recruitment maneuver is positive, it su suggests the need for higher PEEP. If it's negative, it should not be continued in the same position, but repeat it in the prone position, for example, before abandoning it as a, as a technique and repeat after deterioration or airway suctioning. That's all I had to say about recruitment maneuvers. I'll be glad to, to answer any questions or, or, uh, or field complaints. Thank you. John, thanks very much for a terrific talk. Uh, there's a question, third row from the back. Uh, one question I had we had to do, you had mentioned keeping lung edema to a minimum. Uh, yesterday you had talked about how when uh, you can actually increase injury by decreasing the post-capillary pressure. And uh, since our one way to keep lung edema down is to give diuretics, mm -hmm. does that uh, have the potential for increasing lung injury? That's a very good question. If the cardiac output stays the same, uh, you know, we, uh, let me just editorialize for a second. We think as critical care physicians that we're, we're pretty smart. We can manipulate cardiac output and all that. Your body is much smarter. The oxygen consumption of the patient determines what the cardiac output's gonna be. If the cardiac output uh, is maintained at a higher rate, uh, heart rate, smaller stroke, stroke volume because of the diuretic, uh, and you, you lower your wedge pressure, uh, you, you may or may not change the, the, uh, the upstream pressure at all. I think excessive diuresis has the potential for, for causing trouble, you know, but it's, it's a function of what happens to cardiac output, what's happening to the, uh, the microvascular pressures on the upstream side and on the downstream side. Sometimes diuretics don't influence wedge pressure worth, worth a darn. You know, the, uh, if, you're, if your wedge pressure really drops then, uh, then uh, I, I might be a little more concerned about it, but I have no data in humans. I have one other question. When, you, uh, when you've done your recruitment maneuver and you've, and you've increased PEEP, how do you find out, uh, what, what indices do you use that, to find out what that closing pressure is or what PEEP you need? Do you, do you look at uh, dynamic compliance uh, or some, some measure of that? We, we use both signals, uh, and, and uh, to be honest with you, Oxygenation is still what we use because it's the simplest. Uh, it, it, the saturation is obviously a very crude signal. And if you see a big drop or a big increase, uh, well, a big drop as you're dropping your peep down, that's probably telling you there's a lot of lung units that are collapsing. So uh, oxygen saturation can be, uh, can be a, a um, good indicator, we think, that uh, you're, you're, you're certainly losing ground. Uh, I, I agree with Luciano that we need to look more carefully at CO2 and, and uh, perhaps the continuous intraarterial blood gas uh, technique, wh which, you know, was very popular 15 years ago to talk about, and, and some people tried to, to market it. It works great in the lab, and it's been a flop at the bedside. Uh, people just, just haven't caught on to it, although it would be an ideal way, really, to look at all those things, the CO2, the pH, the... Um, 
what we do is on the way down. By the way, we take our time. You know, so once we once we have chain, uh, come down off the high pressure uh, pressure control peep value, drop it down to something we're comfortable with. It's a guess, but we go 40, 20, something like that, and then move it down in small small steps over you know five to ten minutes uh, between steps until we we level in at the right level. And when we see the drop, then re-recruit and reestablish that peep tidal volume com combination. John, Luciano made a very strong point against just the use of PO oxygenation yesterday based on effects of cardiac output. So do you think that the, that's overblown or what's like, Luciano's not here unfortunately to defend it, but uh, just expand on that a little bit? Um, there, there are so many things that influence oxygenation uh, and saturation, by the way, including pH. You know, by the way, another, another reason to use pressure control ventilation is to maintain ventilation during the, the, the uh, maneuver so that the saturation that you're looking at is more or less an accurate reflection of what's happening at, at, in the alveolar units. If you get acidosis developing, then you're going to get a lower saturation by a point, by half a point, by a point over that, over that 40 to, to 50 second period of time during the recruitment maneuver. With pressure control ventilation, you maintain the pH. The oxygenation is simpl the simplest one to do. It correlates reasonably well, we think. Uh, the extreme example I showed you in the laboratory uh, is, a, is, a good, uh, is a good indicator that uh, it's not perfect. The other, th the other problem, though, is that unless you're in the prone position, the mechanics changes aren't perfect either. I mean, th that's an admixture of information um, so we don't really have a gold standard for recruited lung tissue at the bedside. I like Luciano's idea of looking at PaCO2, uh, but just a hypothesis. At the yeah, it's just a yeah. hypothesis at the moment. Yeah, we use oxygenation simply because it's easy. John, recruitment maneuvers. Oh, oh, can you put the microphone up here? And while you're getting it, recruitment maneuvers are are better said to be better in in, in secondary air, secondary ARDS. But if I remember, looked at your study correctly, when you show the data, the lake acid had the very transitory effect. The recruitment were very transitory. How does that tie in with the concept of secondary ARDS being are better? Well, it's, it's highly recruitable. 55% uh, of all the lung units were recruitable. Unfortunately, if you don't do anything with a PEEP after you've recruited, you're going to lose your benefit. So even at the higher PEEPs, it was less, it was, was it transitory? I thought it was still a very, quite transitory. Uh, it's it's a more than than in the other models. Yeah, That's, I'm, I'm comparing different models rather than at the uh, different peep levels. Yeah, I, I think uh, Art, there are some lung units that are going to close at almost any peep. Uh, so there, there, you do lose some of the some of the effect, um, but you know it, it doesn't take away from the fact that it's a very recruitable model. And uh, if you do adjust PEEP at the end of the recruitment maneuver, that you can maintain the great majority of the at-risk lung units open. Final Art, question up to Art, before you move yeah. on, I just wanted to, it's Mitchell back in the room, I just wanted to mention something about oxygenation because I think that the key is, uh, and Luciano showed, when he looked, showed his slide yesterday, looking at the rate of decrease in oxygenation, it may not be linear. And, it, and I'm going to show some of this in a minute. So I think the key is looking to see how fast at different phases the rate of oxygen uh, loss is. And I think that's important. And that might help discriminate a little bit. Well, that's going to be hard to, to implement at the bedside, looking at rate of oxygen change. Isn't yeah, it? if no, with a continuous PO2 catheter, as yeah. John just alluded to. Okay. Uh, there's yeah. a question up here. Yeah, you strongly advocate prone position. Yes. How strong is the data that it affects mortality, if you take mortality as the end point? I strongly advocated uh, consideration of the prone position. At our institution, we do not prone every patient. I don't think it makes sense to prone every patient. However, when our plateau pressures are getting up to a range where I'm getting concerned and the patient's difficult to oxygenate, I go to it early. The data that support that um, actually come from two sources, well, probably more than two sources. In Luciano's study, as I mentioned yesterday, in the quartile of patients who are most severely ill, there was more than a having 
of the mortality difference between supine, uh, between proned and not proned. Okay? That's even proning the patient only seven hours a day. So the subset of his data, post hoc analysis, looking at the most severely ill patients, there was a big mortality difference. There were, are suggestions of the same effect happening at high tidal volumes and also in the Spanish proning trial. So th how strong are the data? I think the data are pretty strong that you don't do it in everybody if you don't need to. But if you have a seriously ill patient, you ought to consider it. I can give you lots of anecdo anecdotes. You won't, don't, won't don't want to hear them. Possibly you won't believe them. But they, they can be life-saving at, uh, at times, as, particularly if they're combined with a recruiting maneuver. The third row, fourth row. Uh, yes, I'd like to, uh, to uh, get the opinion of any of the speakers, but specifically you two guys, um, on the use of closed suction either just before or just after the recruitment maneuvers, and also what mode should the ventilator be in? Well, first of all, I think uh, too little attention has been paid to uh, clearing out the airway you know, before doing any of these recruiting maneuvers. I, th I think uh, if you have retained secretions, obviously it should be uh, removed. Closed suction techniques make more sense than, than, uh, uh, than disconnecting the circuit like we used to do many years ago, but they're not foolproof, and they probably do induce uh, some collapse. It's probably best to clear the airway before you do the recruiting maneuver because that's, that's what you're hoping to reestablish. You're, tr you're trying to reinflate the, um, the lung that's partially closed by the, by the suction technique. Uh, in terms of mode of ventilation, I think that dep depends on the patient that you're, you're managing and what you feel comfortable with. I mean, I've used pressure support ventilation for very seriously ill patients because it's the only way I could get the patient to coordinate with a ventilator and, and look reasonably comfortable, high-level pressure support. In others, I use assist control, pressure assist control. Uh, I think if you know what you're doing and you pay attention to the monitored plateau pressures and peeps and so on, you can use most modes in most patients acceptably well. Uh, did that answer your question or not? Some people believe, or there's a perception, that open suction is more effective than closed suction. And so they disconnect the patient and get more secretions. Well, what's happening actually is, I, I believe, is that they're losing the PEEP and you're, you know, you're losing that FRC, and that's moving the secretions closer to the, to the catheter. Do you, do you know, some, those some people are right. <laughs> uh, really. I mean, I mean it's certainly in the laboratory, if you've got an edematous lung and you take PEEP off, or you've seen it many times clinically, sure. yeah. There's a flooding of the airway, and it's not flooded with fluid that wasn't in the alveoli. It was in the alveoli, and now you're pumping it into the central airway where it might be removed. So I think it, it does make some sense to let, the, let the, the, uh, the pressure fall during that suctioning technique so long as the patient doesn't get hypoxemic. And uh, if for some patients with copious secretion production, it does make sense to let the lung deflate transiently, suction the airway, and then recruit the lung. Make sure you do a, a recruiting maneuver. And for m my money, pressure control ventilation is the way to do it. Over a couple of minutes' time, you will, w you will restore uh, the, the lung volume that you've lost uh, during the disconnection. Good, good question. Final question. Uh, over. Uh, Dr. Marini, since we don't see too many Swangans catheters in critical care anymore, um, what would you think about using volumetric CO2 monitoring not only to look at your potential increase in alveolar ventilation, but also to maybe see transient changes in your cardiac output? Well, there, you know, there are about five non-invasive techniques for cardiac output determination. One is called the NICO, okay? Now, I've used the NICO. In the laboratory, it seems to, to correlate pretty well with Swangian's measurements. Um, in the, at the bedside, we're not really sure what the effects of shunt are and so on. The company tries to, tries to adjust, uh, and, uh, you know, we get a number. You know, the little old lady, you don't want to put the, the, the Swangian's catheter in because it's invasive. Hook up the NICO, 
and you get a cardiac output determination, which sometimes can, can you know, take your thinking and move it in a different direction. Uh, you know, is this woman uh, uh, acidotic because of her kidneys, or is she acidotic because of, of insufficient cardiac output kind of thing? Um, I, I like the idea. I like the, uh, I like the volume-based capnometry uh, for all the information it provides, including oxygen consumption, which, as I hinted at yesterday, I think we ought to be trying to minimize more so that we can then m minimize minute ventilation, frequency, um, cardiac output. You know,